In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Though our sins are scarlet, you've made us white as snow. Though our sins are scarlet, you've made us white as snow. Amen. And I want to turn your attention to Galatians. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. This is what the Bible says. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. If you keep reading, verse 9, he asks, why would you turn again to the beggarly elements? Verse 10, you observe days, months, times, and years. Verse 11, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor, in vain. Verse 19. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Everybody say that with me. Until Christ be formed in you. Now go with me to verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? Everybody say allegory. Huh. Interesting. Let's continue. For these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai with gendereth. Notice that word, gendereth which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. You know, if you read that chapter, you, you go from heirs and tutors and governors and crying Abba Father to beggarly elements and times and seasons and now we're into Hagar and some kind of covenant and Jerusalem that now is and Jerusalem that is above and what in the world and people shut the Bible and grab a comic book a Spider-Man comic book <laughs> can't handle all that I don't know what that's talking about 
where we're going to try to help you shut that Spider-Man comic book and open this Bible back up. Spider-Man doesn't save anybody. But Jesus does. Jesus does. And I want to talk to you for a few moments, if you'll give me the liberty to just take my time. I'm going to talk to you on a message I'm entitling, Abraham had two sons. Abraham had two sons. Praise God. God bless you. You can be seated. It is good to see the Blankenship family here today. It's good to see the Filkins here today. Amen. Family that has come in for the wedding, we're glad you could join us. It's good to have Brother Colby and Sister Joni here today. Amen. <clears throat> Let's talk about the abstract nature of this chapter. It's kind of esoteric. It's kind of, uh, that's a big word. It means out there. It's hard to get your hands around it. It's, uh, you, have to, you have to take the time to understand how God talks. Because God talks. God's talking to us right now. Matter of fact, God never stops talking to us. God talks to you in your dreams. Oftentimes, it's the only way he can get our attention. During the day, we're making money. We're stressing. We're buying boats and sea dews and four-wheelers and trying to figure out how we're going to do whatever. And during it all, God is talking. God is talking. And he's talking here. He's talking. He's talking in this chapter. And he's. He's trying to get a point across to his people. And so. He this thing ranges from Paul teaching about children and tutors and governors. And he winds up talking somehow about Abraham and Sarah. And if you're not following that, if you're not a student of Scripture, it sounds just like it's a convoluted thing and people just throw their hands up in exasperation. But what God is really trying to say is that there's going to be two births. That's, that's what God's getting down to here. That before Jesus came, Humanity was under the law, which was our tutor. It was just like, just like an heir would be under a teacher or a mentor. Oftentimes in scripture, there would be a king, but the king would only be eight years old, nine years old. His father would die. He would be thrust into a kingship. And in that kingship... He was the king, but he's too young. He is naive. He is tender. He can't take care of the affairs of state. He can't deal with the manipulations of people. People are sneaky. People are crafty. Now, I know nobody in this room is, but I'm talking about other people. <laughs> now, we're all angels in this room, I'm sure. And so they would put a tutor. They would put a mentor over that boy. And he was there to protect him until he came of age. And when he came of age, then he would enter into his kingship. That's what God was saying. The Old Testament was your tutor until you got to a place you could understand. The Old Testament was there to hold your hand before you entered into the spirit world. You can't enter into the spirit world without a covering and a protection. And you better know what you're doing when you enter into the spirit world. And so God said, I'm not going to bring you into the realm of demons and angels. 
until you're ready. Now, folks, they waltz into that spirit world all the time. They just waltz in without a care in this world. And, and, and the world has a way they describe it. They say they get drunk or they get high or they enjoy their music. But I will tell you that when you enter into any of those spiritual gateways, you're entering into a spirit world. You're entering into a place where things attach themselves to you. And, and before you know it, your head is filled with voices. Your head is filled with troubles. Your life is filled with chaos. What's going on? Well, I just got a bunch of issues. I just need another drink, is what the world says. But I'll tell you, you don't need another drink. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. I... I was built for Jesus. I was built for fellowship with him. And I don't want to enter into that spirit world unless I go through the right gate. Amen. Alcohol is the wrong gate. LSD is the wrong gate. I know it's being legalized, but marijuana is the wrong gate. Somebody said, well, I'm just going to smoke a little weed. Well, they call it a gateway drug for a reason. And it's the wrong gate, brother. You step through that gate at 15, and when you're 50, you've got a host of devils hanging off of you. And you've opened up doors you never thought you would open up. Doors that are easy to open, but they're very hard to close. And now it's Oxycontin. And now it's, now it's narcotics. Now it's opioids. Now it's everything that will destroy your body and your spirit. How many marriages have to be destroyed because you entered into the spirit world without Jesus Christ? I made up my mind, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go through the straight gate. I'm going to walk the narrow way. And I'm going to enter into there with the covering of Jesus Christ. I want his angels camping round about me. There is a gate that you walk through. So the law is given to hold our hand until we're ready. And then God sent a deliverer. The Bible says made of a woman born under the law. And God sent his spirit into our hearts and we cry, Abba, Father. That's another way of saying they spoke with other tongues. And when they spoke with other tongues, the Bible says you're no more a servant but you're a son. Aren't you glad for the day you got the Holy Ghost? Okay. I probably should help some people with this. I need, to, I need to get my definitions right. Because a lot of people, when they read that word servant, they say, uh, okay, servant. That's somebody who serves. Well, it's a little more than that. It actually means slave. To understand what he's saying, you need to know what happened when Adam sinned. When Adam sinned, he, he went from being a son of God and he turned to Satan and he let Satan handcuff him. Satan hooked a leash to Adam's neck and said, now you'll follow me. Before you followed God, but now you'll follow me. You need to know what a sinner is. A sinner We've, we've whitewashed that word in our world today. Nobody, nobody's a sinner anymore. They just have issues. <laughs> you know, back in the old days, when you, when, you, when you needed God, you just came to the altar and said, God, I'm a mess. Now, I'm not just a mess. I'm a hot mess. And I need you to forgive me, and I need you to have mercy on me because I'm going to hell. Well, nobody's going to hell anymore. Have you noticed that? Mobsters don't even go to hell anymore. You know, they, they're in the casket and everybody, the guy's up there and he's saying, well, he's in the hands of God. And everybody that knew him is out there going, no, he's not. He is. If anybody was burning, that guy's burning right there. And you talk about all the good stuff. He loved puppies. And you pick out that one good story. Now forget the 7,000 monstrous things he did. No, we're just here to make you feel better. We're just here to slather a little bit of Novocaine on you and numb you to the eternal reality 
that he's in hell. Hell's not a joke, ladies and gentlemen. And I, and this, this, I know it sounds heavy, but, but most people aren't going to heaven. It's called a narrow way for a reason. Oh, not, not in this politically correct world we live in. Everybody's going to heaven, I know. I know it's not popular to say that, but I'll tell you, our world could use a, a good dose of old-fashioned hell preaching. You need, you need to get a grip uh, on eternity. You need to realize that eternity hangs in the balance this morning. And I've made up my mind, I'm going to be born of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be born of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want to enter in and I want to hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. If it's a narrow way and hell's path is broad, you have to come to grips with that. Praise God. And so, so this is the picture that he's painting here. He came to redeem them that were under the law. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he launches into Abraham and Sarah. <laughs> and I mean, it's just like you're just being jerked back and forth. To get all of this, you need to know what a sinner is. A sinner is not somebody that has issues. A sinner is not someone that just needs therapy. When I meet people today, they don't want Bible study. They want therapy. Brother Urshan, I heard you have a background in therapy. Sit down and fix me. Man, I can't fix you. Can't even fix myself. <laughs> I need Jesus. You need Jesus. And, and, and there are therapeutic concepts, but I'm going to let you in on a little dirty secret in the therapeutic world. The, the recidivism rate is something like 95%. And, and a lot of times they just charge you about 150 bucks an hour, and they're really happy to do that. And they'll give you some good life tips, and they can help you, and they can straighten stuff out. I'm not saying they don't. I actually do believe in therapy to a point. But when it gets to salvation and eternity, we need God. We need the Word of God. Praise God. We need the Holy Ghost. God can do more in five minutes than a therapist could do in 20 years. Man, sometimes you just need an old-fashioned baptism of the Holy Ghost where he strips the pride out of you, where he pulls the arrogance out of you, where he breaks that carnal nature, and you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Ah, oh, I need Jesus this morning. Well, just give me a Xanax and tell me how to schedule my day. And if they can't fix you, they'll just put a nice white jacket on you and tie it up. And, and, and the friends in the white coats will come and take you to the nice place. <laughs> That's what they do when they can't fix you. A sinner... A sinner is a child of Satan. You have to let the full impact of that hit you. When Adam sinned, he became of this world. He became a slave. He placed himself in handcuffs to hell. And so the Bible uses the words... It uses very strong language to describe this. Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. Well, how can the devil be my father? I mean, I know some guys I think are the devil, but I mean, literally, I mean, what, what are we talking about here? And what it means is that spiritually the devil controls us. That's all of us, ladies and gentlemen. Before, when we're born in Adam, we are sinners. You're born into handcuffs. That's why the Bible says that that mountain gendereth to bondage. It literally means you're born into slavery. It gendereth. Gendereth means born into, procreates. You are, you are born with Adam's curse. That's why it's so easy to sin. That's why it's called the sin that doth so easily beset us. That's why it's easier to holler at somebody than it is to bless somebody. It's easier to curse somebody than it is to give them life. It's either to go down than it is to go up. You got to fight to go up. You got to push against the grain. You got to swim upstream. It sometimes it's tough to get out of bed on a Sunday morning, but you've got to you've got to live for the things of God, not the things of this world. You've got to be born again. 
You got to be born again. You got to switch your birth from Adam to Jesus. I, I, that's what I want to get into today. I want to talk about that. Because there are strong feelings in people. Impulses. You can't control them. Thoughts that you wish you could get rid of, you can't get rid of them without the Holy Ghost. You can't take enough alcohol. You can't take enough chemical substance to get rid of the thoughts. There are people with terrible memories here. The only way you know how to get rid of the memory is to sedate it. I know people that haven't been sober for decades. They self-medicate to get through. There's people that wish they could control their mind. I'm just talking, I'm just talking about the truth right now. I'm just telling you the way, the way it is. There are people that want to control their minds, control their hearts, and it's like trying to tame a bucking bronco. It's like trying to tame some kind of a wild beast. And, and, and the only way to get over that fallen, Adamic nature is to get the Holy Ghost and let God fill you with His Spirit. And that's every day. You gotta die every day. You gotta kill Adam every day. You gotta crucify the flesh with the affections and the lusts there of and you got to put him on a cross Paul said I die daily well if you die daily you can live daily I can live to Jesus Christ I can live to the Holy Ghost I can let him fill me with his spirit because there's two sons and you got to find out which one's going to have supremacy so we, we go to Abraham and Sarah let's go ahead and go there can I take my time this morning how much time do I have? I don't want to. All right. <laughs> Here's one person that likes it. <laughs> the other people are like, you got about 20 minutes, Brother Urshan. <laughs> hey, Lord. How's Abraham and Sarah fit in? All right. I think the first place I'll go to with this is that there was a miraculous birth. Sarah had a baby as she approached 100 years of age. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's mind-boggling. It's actually impossible. So God doesn't just insert a baby into her womb. God had to touch her body to where she could actually produce. It says of Sarah that it had ceased to be with her after the manner of women. Well, that just means that she'd gone through the change. And her body's dead. It says of Abraham, he was as good as dead. So physically, he is dead. But God said, you're going to have a son. And it was so crazy that they laughed. You know the story? You know the Bible story? Because the supernatural looks crazy to carnal people. But God was saying, there's going to be a birth. Have you ever noticed that every one of those patriarchs' wives were barren? You ever read that? Every one of them centered around barrenness. Sarah's womb is barren. Rebecca is barren. Rachel is barren. There's this barrenness in every single one of them. And God did that on purpose. God was telling us that there is going to be an impossibility in our lives. The world says it's impossible to feel what you feel right now. The world says that church doesn't work anymore. The church, the, the world says that talking in tongues is crazy. They laugh at it. The world says that lifting your hands and weeping in the presence of God, it, you've lost your mind because the world always has thought that. They view it as a barren womb. They view it as a waste of time. They view it as something that they don't need to be involved in. But I'm going to tell you that that barren womb is going to give life. God was saying that when this happens, ladies and gentlemen, I will touch you from heaven. And when I touch you from heaven, it's going to blow your mind. It's going to be supernatural. It's going to be dynamic. It's going to be powerful. People are going to shake their heads. People are going to scratch their heads because there's no way you should be making it. But you are making it because something happened in your life that we can't describe. You can't put the Holy Ghost under a microscope. You can't put the Holy Ghost in a laboratory. But it's a supernatural birth. And it will save you and deliver you. And it's God's will. 
So when I say that you're going to get the Holy Ghost and you're going to speak with other tongues, it's just like saying you're going to have a baby at 100. Now to further prove it, God said, oh, you think that's a miracle? Watch, I'm going to touch a virgin. Now laugh about that. The impossible becomes possible. And there are folks that will say it's impossible to get the Holy Ghost. There's a religious world that fights against the Holy Ghost. I sat down with, a, with an old boy the other day and I, I looked at him and he said, Now, Brother Urshan, what's this Holy Ghost stuff? And I said, Well, you're going to receive the Spirit of God. He's going to come into your, hearts and your, your heart and you're going to talk in tongues. And his eyes got as big around as silver dollars. I'm going to What? You're going to talk in tongues. And he went, oh, my, my church taught me I couldn't do that. My, my church taught me that that wasn't for us. They're afraid of that supernatural expression. Well, man, I'm glad I'm in a church where they know it can happen. Well, here's something for you. Peter got the Holy Ghost and he talked in tongues. James got the Holy Ghost. John got the Holy Ghost. Bartholomew got the Holy Ghost. Matthew got the Holy Ghost. Mark got the Holy Ghost. Mary got the Holy Ghost. Paul got the Holy Ghost. And he spoke with other tongues. What in the world? Why wouldn't I want the Holy Ghost? Man, you got to grab a hold of the faith of Abraham and say, I don't understand it all, but I'm going to believe God. I believe the God that can do that is a God that can do it right now. God can touch me. He can fill me. He can baptize me. And there can be a new birth. There can be a new birth. And into that barren, impossible situation comes life. The Bible says that when, when the baby was born, that God said you're going to name him Isaac. Isaac means laughter. <laughs> I, I love that. I think that's great. He, God said, name him laughter, because you laughed. That's why God named him that. So Abraham laughed, and Sarah laughed, and God said, now because you laughed, I'm going to give you a baby named laughter. I mean, let that hit you. That means, that means when little laughter is five years old, they're not laughing anymore. When little laughter starts taking those wobbly, <laughs> you laughing now? Look at what God did. There's a lot of people that laughed at the beginning. But when your life starts walking, and when your miracle starts talking, and when your miracle starts living, and when your miracle starts breathing, who's laughing now? Watch as the miracle grows. Watch as the miracle develops. Watch what happens as God shows that he is strong and he is well able. Watch as my marriage gets stronger and stronger. Watch as my children grow up in the fear of the Lord. I love watching young adults get married and the blessing of God come on them because I'm not laughing anymore. You laughed when I raised my hands. You laughed when I talked in tongues. But oh, you're not laughing now. Now they're living for God. Now they're overcoming sin. Now they're living for and your miracle will turn into something beautiful. And God gets the last laugh. So don't let anybody laugh at Pentecost. I've seen it my whole life. People will come in and they'll, they'll see somebody worship the Lord. I learned a long time ago, just lift your hands and glorify God. And I can feel people just watching me. Just... What's he doing? What kind of church did you drag me to? <laughs> Stick around. You'll see more than that. You, you, you get it cranking and somebody will take off running. You, you, you get this thing moving and somebody will just start doing a little two-step. Like just like that. Maybe a little bit more demonstrative than that. <laughs> somebody will start talking in tongues. Amen. 
And I learned a long time ago, I will not allow the mockery of Ishmael to stop the praise of Isaac. You don't know where I was. You don't know how impossible it was. When that lady brought the alabaster box and she broke it at the feet of Jesus, they laughed at her. But she was anointing God. I was in a bad place and he found me. I was in a hopeless condition and he delivered me. There was no way out, but he brought me out. And so I'm here to engage in the supernatural. I'm here to walk in faith. And I don't do it with alcohol and I don't do it with LSD. I do it with the Holy Ghost. And so laughter and mockery is a part of it from the very beginning. It's part of this birth experience. So on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And, and, and some said they're full of new wine. Some of them said they're drunk. And others mocking said. There's always been a mockery that laughs at the things of God. That doesn't bother me. Keep on praising him. Keep on loving him. The, the two births are different. There is two births. And, and he says these things are an allegory. They're a metaphor. They're an illustration. I want to take the last few minutes of this service and I want to talk about this because you need to know about these two births. These two births are a big deal. Because one of them gendereth to bondage. And one of them is born of the Spirit. The Bible says that this Mount Sinai is Jerusalem that now is. And there is a Jerusalem that is above. There's two Jerusalems. One of them's in the flesh, and one of them's in the Spirit. What he was saying was that the physical Jews and everybody born of the flesh, they gender to bondage. They give birth to bondage. But those that are born from Jerusalem that is above are born of the Spirit. And like Ishmael persecuted Isaac, the flesh will persecute the Spirit. That's all right. Praise him anyway. Glorify him anyway. you got to figure out which son I'm going to be a part of. Which son is going to be the lineage that I spring from. You see it in Jacob and Esau when God says that... Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. The elder shall serve the younger. You've heard, some of you have heard me preach it. It ties into this idea that there's two sons. That there's two sons. You have two sons that you have to contend with. I have two sons that I have to contend with. The first son was born on May 3rd, 1976. That's my, that's my Esau. That's my Ishmael. That's my flesh. And he's a mighty hunter. My flesh is cunning. My flesh is strong. My flesh thinks it doesn't need God. My flesh thinks it doesn't need church. My flesh thinks it doesn't need to read the Bible. My flesh thinks it doesn't need a pastor. My flesh thinks it doesn't need to pray. My flesh is predatory. That's why Esau's a hunter. Praise God. That's the older brother. And he's strong and he has dominion. And he takes the primary role in our lives. But if you stick around and you serve God, there's a second birth that's coming. That second birth is the day that you're baptized in Jesus' name. And you're filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you're born again of water and the spirit now adam's not your father now jesus is your father now you want to read the word of god now you can't wait till the church doors open up now you can't wait till the holy ghost touches you again and again and again and again now you can't wait to sing the songs of zion now you can't wait to feel the presence of god god hates the first and he loves the second the second one knows he's dependent on God. The second one will fight an angel for the blessing. The first one will sell out for a bowl of soup. The first one sells out for temporary satisfaction. People do it all the time. Esau smelled the soup. And he said, what good does the birthright do me if I die? 
So, ball of soup, fruit in a garden, people sell out eternity for a lot of temporary things. They sell out for money. They sell out for relationships. They sell out for fame. They sell out for convenience. People sell out. And the problem with all those things is they fill you up for a second and then you're hungry again. You get hungry again. Anybody figure out that you can take a drink and it fills you up for a moment, but then, you, but then you're thirsty again? The next day, you got you to go get drunk again. Then you got to need another hit. You got to get high again, because after the high is over, you come back down. After you get rid of one boyfriend, you got to find another boyfriend. Because the problem's not the boyfriend, honey. The problem's in your heart. You've got to be complete in yourself. And so you go from person to person, from drink to drink, from drug to drug, because you get hungry again. That's why Jesus looked at the woman at the well and said, I've got water that if you drink it, you will never thirst again. It will satisfy you. It will keep you. It will make you whole. It will make you complete. I'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. And you won't need that drink. You won't need that pipe. You won't need another relationship. You'll have the thing you've been looking for. You'll whole life and so Esau sells out for temporary pleasure and the Bible says I've hated Esau and I've loved Jacob the elder shall serve the younger what that means ladies and gentlemen is my old man has to serve my new man that means when I woke up this morning, my old man said, why don't you stay in bed, Nathan? It was a long day yesterday. I imagine somebody else could take care of service for you. Don't you feel sick? <laughs> what, what, is that a headache I feel coming on? <laughs> I stumped my toe. Oh, pastor. Can't make it in. I stumped my toe last night. Pray for me. <laughs> Lord, bless so-and-so's toe. Help them, Jesus. Because <laughs> the flesh will look for every opportunity to squirm out and to wiggle out of the things of God. Well, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray more. And then they go through a whole day and they don't pray. Well, I'll pray tomorrow morning. The alarm goes off late. You get up. Well, I'll pray on the way to work. And through traffic, you go, thank you, Jesus, love you, help me, God, need you, okay, hallelujah, praise you. Well, here I am at work. I'll pray when I get home. And the weeks turn into months, and the months turn into years. And if you let the flesh dominate you, the wrong son will be in the driver's seat. And you'll walk in the flesh, and you'll talk in the flesh, and you'll think in the flesh, and the flesh will have dominion of your life. You have got to grab your flesh and say, you have messed my life up. You have destroyed my life. You have wrecked my life. Esau is not fit for the inheritance. You don't talk right. You don't dress right. You don't act right. You don't think right. It's time to let the second son take dominion. And I'm going to walk in the spirit. I'm going to walk after God. You don't find time to pray. You make time to pray. And you call on God. And you get a hold of God. And you crucify the flesh. We are going to church. We are going to praise God. We are going to glorify God. I love the things of God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek his face. And if you'll give Jacob that preeminence, God said, I love that. And I hate the other. Now I'm going to warn you, Esau's strong. When you see Esau chasing Jacob, Esau said, I'll kill him. That's why the flesh wants to kill your experience. It wants the control back. Your old man doesn't go easy. Don't let him up. Crucify him. Daily. <laughs> when you wake up in the morning, your old man's going to sit up and he's going to groggily shake his head and say, all right, I'm ready to take over again. You've got to jump on him and, and nail him back down to the cross. <laughs> Not so fast, big boy. I'm liking the Holy Ghost joy I have. I thank God for the peace I have. I can sleep with a clean conscience. Ha, my marriage is better than it's ever been. 
He's full of the Holy Ghost. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. My kids are full of the Holy Ghost. The blessings of the Lord are too great. I've got to fight against this flesh. So I'm not going to laugh at those jokes. And I'm not going to talk like that. And I'm not going to love food more than I love the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live. Appetite will not control me. The word of God will control me. Because Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. I know it's growing late. And all the Jacobs are saying, preach! And all the Esau's are saying, but the buffet's closing. <laughs> you have any idea of the crowd? You know how hard it is to find a seat at Dale's? <laughs> Esau can already smell the buffet from the Chinese restaurant. <laughs> oh, I gotta stop, I cracked myself up. <laughs> hey Lord back away from the story because I know it looks like it's like a Bible story but I'm telling you these things are an allegory these things are an allegory it's not just a story but it's a story of two sons it's a story of an older boy that's born of the flesh and a younger boy that's born of the Spirit. One will be rejected and one will be accepted. If you walk in your flesh, heaven's not for you. But if you walk in the Spirit, he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So back away. Back away from the story. Back away from Jacob and Esau and see the panorama. See the, the widescreen. Because it's not just Jacob and Esau, but it's Ishmael and Isaac. And it's not just Ishmael and Isaac, but it's Manasseh and Ephraim. Which then becomes Ephraim and Manasseh when the younger takes over. And Israel crosses his hands and places Ephraim in supremacy over Manasseh. Joseph gets mad and says, no, no, he's the older son. I know, but the younger one's greater because the elder shall serve the younger. Your flesh has to serve your spirit. you got to look at your carnal man and say, we are going to church. Those kids are not going to stay home. You're not going to sit them in front of that TV and let their brains rot out of their head. You are going to get those little kids dressed. You comb that little hair. You teach those little hands to get raised up in the air because the elder has to serve the younger. I'm not going to let the works of the flesh dominate me, but I'm going to walk in the Spirit and think in the Spirit and live in the Spirit. There's two sons. It's Cain and Abel. And ultimately, it's Adam and Jesus. It's the first son of God wrestling with the second son of God. It's, it's the one that was of the earth earthy and the other that's made a quickening spirit to the point that the Bible calls the first one the first Adam and calls Jesus the last Adam. Can I have three more minutes? Hallelujah. I want this to get across. I want everybody to hear what I'm saying right now. Because if you can see Jacob putting on Esau's clothes. You know the story where Jacob put on his clothes and Jacob said, I'm going to go to the father. The father's not going to accept me, but he'll accept Esau. So I'm going to put on Esau's clothes and I'm going to put on the skins of an animal. <laughs> If you can see Jacob pulling those clothes on, you should be able to see Jesus coming in the flesh. You should be able to see God coming in flesh and putting on Adam's clothes. The younger brother puts on the older brother's clothes and he goes into the father and the father accepts him as the older brother. When, when, when Jesus came walking into the father, he accepted him as Adam. He accepted him as the flesh. He put on the flesh. He lived in the flesh. He walked in the flesh. He walked in the clothes of Esau and he paid the price and the birthright 
transferred from the older brother to the younger brother. And now I've got life in Jesus. Now my inheritance is in Jesus. Now everything I have, it's by Jesus. These things are an allegory. Let's stand in the presence of God this morning. Hallelujah. He put on the garments of the flesh that he might redeem us and present himself to the Father. (laughs) Praise God. Musicians come. Let's lift our hands in this house. Right where you are. Abraham had two sons. The first one gendereth to bondage. The second one is a servant of the Most High God. The first one is born in Jerusalem down here. But the second one is born from Jerusalem up there. (laughs) You ever wonder why they were twins? They were twins because you can have the same face in a different spirit. You come to church, God fills you with the Holy Ghost. You're different. You're kind. You're patient. You're full of the Spirit of God. Your spirit's right. And wives look at their husbands and say, I've been praying for this day for a long time that God would fill you with the Holy Ghost. And the husband with tears in his eyes said, Thank God. I don't know why I did the stuff I did. I don't know why I ran around like I did. And Jacob's born. But if you don't crucify that flesh daily, there's another twin. There's another nature. And if you don't pray on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, by Thursday, there's a different voice talking out of you. It's the same face because they're twins. But now your attitude's rotten. Now you mock the things of God. Now... Now you don't read your Bible. Now you're back to what you used to be. What happened? There's another twin. There's an older brother that you've let get in the driver's seat. Hallelujah. You need to kill the flesh today. Let's lift our hands to heaven. I know, I know the flesh didn't want to lift its hands, but lift it anyway. The flesh says, I worked a long time yesterday, Brother Urshan. I, 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 got, I, I got a lot going on. I got a lot happening after. So, but lift your hands anyway, Jacob. Lift your hands, child of God. Lift your hands, servant of the Most High God. Because Abraham had two sons. All over this building, as they begin to sing, I want somebody to lift your voice and say, I'm here to walk in the Spirit, Jesus. Fill me. Fill me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one.